Hi. So hi, my name is Michael. I'm going to take five minutes. I'm going to explain to you what we're looking at. We're standing in the white light mixed reality tech lab. What is that? What we basically have put our heads together and we've tried to find a solution to do virtual and augmented reality without the green screen. There's nothing wrong with green screen, but what we find as a challenge in a green screen environment is that you have no relationship with your content. I can't see it. I don't know where I am. If I'm a professional broadcaster, that's all fine. If I bring an inexperienced pe person in my set, they're a bit lost. It's, it's a bit disorientating, and I, I feel uncomfortable about that. Another challenge is the lighting spill on the green lighting on my face, in my hair, in reflective objects, in transparent objects. There's good cares out there that will solve most of these problems. We're not disputing that. The only thing that we've tried to look at is how can we do this without a green screen? So we've come up with this. So we have three LED walls. We've got one here, one there, and one floor. These are raw, uh, raw black pearl screens. The resolutions are quite acceptable. So 1,200 pixels by 1,000 and about 786 pixel square on the floor. That's all it is. Three LED walls, two track cameras, and a media server-based workflow that allows us to do things like this. All of a sudden, one of the challenges that I mentioned earlier, where you don't have a relationship with your content, that is solved. I can see this. I can relate to this. I've got one, two, three screens. I've got a big screen there. I can point out. I can follow the neon lines. I see these banners and the surroundings. I've created a relationship with my content around me. I don't have to look for my comfort monitor anymore. I can just see all of this right here. A good example of that is what we, what White Light did for Eurosport back in February for the Winter Olympics. We developed the Cube, which is nominated for an uh, IBC award tonight. What it is, is basically what you see here, except there was another wall on that side that would allow presenters to come in there, do analysis with augmented elements. Another advantage of this Cube was that we could bring sports stars into the cube and talk about video footage that I could see. Amy Fuller, who's just won a gold medal in snowboarding and is fresh off the slopes, has been dragged into the IBC. She's a bit scared. She doesn't, she's not used to sit in front of television. So she walks into the cube. She sees this clip and she points at it. And she says, oh, well, that's me. And look what I'm doing there. She's got his arm crossed. She's got her hands in her pockets. Instantly, there's a relationship with this inexperienced TV person and the content around her. Those two, the presenter and Amy Fuller, are having a conversation. It's a very natural connection between the people in the screen and the screen, something you cannot achieve in a green screen environment. This is a very flexible and a very scalable solution. We have a rather small set. This could be 10 times as big. This could be twice as small. A good example of that is what White Light did for ITV coverage of the uh, Football World Cup back in June. You have a small allocated space in the IBC with a lighting rig no higher than two and a half meters above your head. By adding in an augmented reality dome, you make your set look twice, three times as big. What's special about this one is there's a window, a virtual window in there, which was connected to a camera outside the IBC filming the red square. So in graphics, you've created a virtual set extension with a window looking out into the real world. We have that same setup in here. So now you see me in a screen. And Chris is now going to start panning around. And we're going to enter seamlessly into a 3D world. I've got my augmented reality element in there. I can see the content in there. And all of a sudden, here we are. We're now panning the camera around in a real-time rendered 3D model. So our set, which you can see right here, is this three square meters cube, all of a sudden sits in a huge, a huge environment. In that 3D model, I have control of every element. I can change the background. I can feed a 360 degree camera from anywhere in the world onto that spherical map in the back. I can change the content of that big screen. That is something unique that we can work seamlessly between what is in this screen I've now 
just pressed play on the media server. I've just changed the skin of the floor. That's all I did. We didn't load in any new content. I've exposed the parameters for these content screens. This could be video. We've got four SDI inputs on the media server. So I can link any video I want in there. I can have 32 video layers played at the same time and uh, routed to any screen that is in my virtual world. I've added a couple of augmented reality elements, but the big advantage is I see the basketball on the floor. I know it's there, therefore I can avoid stepping on it. After our basketball game, we want to talk about a football game. Again, I just keyframe change of assets, change of textures even, not assets, even a change of textures, and all of a sudden we're in a football environment. The background changes into a feed of the stadium, I can, have other, I can have other video footage in these screens. I can change the color of the LED lines on the lighting desk. The thing to point out here is this Premier League trophy. As you can see in augmented reality, it's there, but I can see it on the floor. It's right here in front of me. Because it's there, I can avoid stepping around. I can avoid stepping on it. I work around it. I, can, I see this without having to look up to my comfort monitor. I know there's my Premier League trophy. Therefore, I know I've got to step around it. After a football game, we want to talk about a tennis. Well, it's just a click. It's just a keyframe in the media server. We all of a sudden reskinned our whole world. The thing to point out here is this 3D statue. This is a real-time rendered 3D, high, highly detailed model. It gets its light and its reflections in real time from the world around it. If I change this world around it, it's instantly updated in the reflections in this statue. You can see the sunlight move around. You can see this being updated in the statue. So this is all one 3D environment. Because it's 3D, the statue, Chris, can now have a look around the statue. He can find the right angles. He can actually go and hang on top of the statue and spiral around her. The schematics part is really simple, and I'll be really quick. You've got your LED screens. You've got your two cameras and your Moses start you mostly star trackers. That data gets fed into the disguise media server. Our 3D model lives in this disguise media server and gets rendered in real time. That passes through vision mixing, gets sent back to the screen, what you see behind me, or to TX. Same system here. Two cameras going to the vision mixer, as per usual. You've got your star tracker, your house sync, your lighting disk, and your iPad controller. Anything that controls this content goes set up in the disguise media server, gets mixed up, sent through Vision Mixer to your LED processors, your TX, and in real time back to your camera returns. Chris sees what you see on TX. He actually sees the whole image with his augmented reality elements, your background, and me in it. It's as if he would be making these shots in real world. This is an in, a, a time lapse of the software package that we use to create the assets. It's called Notch. It's a real-time render engine. You can create your own assets for this. If you used to work with Cinema 4D or 3D Max or Lightwave, you can create your own assets in any third-party external 3D modeling program, drop them into Notch, light them, and texture them. The only difference is I don't have to find my camera angles. I don't have to worry about aspect ratios. I build my 3D model. As it, in, uh, as it was a whole world. I don't render this. I package it. I expose parameters that I want to have the lighting desk or the media server uh, interfere with. I package it, I compile it, and I give it as a whole to the media server, where we link up the virtual cameras that are given their data by the Moses Star Tracker. And that's all there is to it. I'm bringing this scene back because there's something in here that I want to point out. We're in a boxing ring. We're back in this 3D environment. This boxing ring itself, I've cut that in half. Half of it gets sent to what I call the back plate, meaning that is behind me. The other half is living in a front plate, meaning it's in augmented reality, but we call it front plate. So you, I can, I'm able to make shots like this where I'm actually standing in the box ring. Those two halves are perfectly aligned. The only way this is working is if your real-world camera is perfectly aligned versus your screen versus your virtual world. Everybody who's ever done a uh, registration or a calibration knows how hard it is. You've got to find your zero point. You've got to find a reference. You need to know that this wall is straight in 90-degree angles. 
the people at this guys have come up with a brilliant way to solve that. They've created a process which we call auto registration. I'm going to play this clip for you in real time. It lasts 15 seconds. What it is, it's a, a pattern of dots and lines which tells, which gets projected on these screens. This is a screen talking to the camera saying, this is how wide I am. These are my angles. These are how many pixels I have. I'm playing that clip right now and I'm talking through it. So this pattern tells the camera and tells the media server, right, this is where I am as a screen. This is where you are as a camera. This is the angle that you have. We are now perfectly aligned. We can do this for one camera. We do this for five cameras or 10 cameras. It doesn't matter how many cameras you have. You point them at the screen. You lock them. You play the registration process, which is done. We have now registered this, all these cameras. They're perfectly aligned. And we can now go on and start playing with our augmented and virtual reality. Another challenge that we have is how do you blend real world lighting with virtual world lighting? Usually that there's no connection, but we've kind of, we've kind of found a solution to that. And I'm going to demonstrate that if uh, Chris would love, there you go. So I'm going to switch on, or Chris is going to switch on my key light, which is key lights coming from that. I have an identical copy of this spotlight in virtual world. They are both linked to We have now data between real world and virtual world. The real world spotlight hits me. We create a world. So I have now key and fill in real world, and I have it in the virtual world. A final thing I want to talk to you about is the virtue of using this guy's media server apart from everything else I've told you, the auto-registration, four SDI inputs, uh, the ability to handle a lot of video layers all at the same time and render this 3D model is the offline workflow. Everything you see in here has been created far away from the studio. I do this in my studio back in Scotland, someone else, Chris, our lighting designer, has his own studio in England. Someone, our director, is sitting somewhere else. You all work offline, you work remote, you log in, and you work together. You sequence your whole event offline. Your production designer can assess the 3D model with the right perspective in the right cameras. These are your virtual cameras. They're identical copies of this camera. So I can look at my content in the right perspective, and therefore I can work offline in my whole sequence. When I get to the studio, once everybody's happy with the way it looks and the way it's lit and the way it's sequenced, you get to the studio, you set up your cameras, you run your registration, you're up and running within the hour. So that is why we think the media server-based workflow is a really good and very time-saving uh, workflow. That's really it for me. Uh, I do invite you to come on stage at some point and have a look and see in the boxing ring. You can have yourself filmed. We will, uh, we will film that clip and email that to you. Come and speak to us. We're over there, Chris and Peter from this guys, and they'll be able to answer all your questions. Thank you very much, and I hope you. I hope to see you there. Yeah, we're